All right. Well, during family devotions last night, I uh, had a coughing fit because I'm getting over a cold and I was talking. And so hopefully that won't happen this, this morning as I'm preaching. But if it does, um, that's what's going on there. When we uh, step back and take a look at world history and we look at the way that history continues to unfold, it, it raises questions about the direction of history. And of course, many people in the world would say there is no direction to history, that things are just happen, happening uh, randomly and by chance. Um, but for us as Christians, it does raise questions about the direction of history and God's purposes in history. Uh, the world, of course, has been plagued with conflict, conflict as uh, the philosopher Bertrand Russell once said, he said, uh, war does not determine who is right, only who is left. And that often seems to be true. Whoever has the most power can defeat those who have less power, uh, regardless of whether or not they're in the right. And when we think about all of the war and the death, uh, suffering, when we think about political instability, moral decay, it's tempting to think that everything in the world is unraveling. And, and yet for those of us whose faith is in Christ, we know that history is moving in a particular direction. Uh, history, it has been said, I'm not sure who said this, but uh, some have said that history is his story. And uh, God's story has an aim. And yet when we get caught up in everything that's going on, we can become emotionally involved in that. Um, we can become invested in it, and it can be easy to lose sight of what the Lord is doing. So how can we be certain? How can we remember that God is at work fulfilling his purposes in the world around us when things begin to look bleak, when it looks like things might be going in a direction that, that God doesn't want them to go in? And, um, and how can we trust that God's plan will ultimately succeed? Uh, let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9, this morning we'll be looking at verses 24 through 27. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Of course, as we've been looking at Dan, Daniel 9 over the course of the last several weeks, uh, we've been looking at God's revelation to Daniel concerning his plan for the people of Israel. Uh, last week we talked about this period of 77s. And uh, the angel Gabriel revealed that 77s are decreed during which there would be an end to sin and transgression. It would be a time when the final atonement for sin would be made. It would be a time when everlasting righteousness would be ushered in. And in our text for this morning, the, the focus is going to narrow and we're going to see some further nuance and explanation concerning this period of the 77s. And uh, we're going to see how God has been at work orchestrating history according to his purposes uh, to ultimately bring atonement and redemption through Christ. And as we consider these things, we should find comfort in that. We should find uh, a sense of confidence in Christ because we know that God is at work sovereignly fulfilling his purposes in our lives. So... Uh, look with me at Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 24. Again, Daniel is writing, and the angel of Gabriel is speaking and revealing what will take place. Uh, the angel Gabriel says, uh, Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. And we talked about that last week. We looked at each one of those different elements um, in, in some detail. Uh, Gabriel continues, he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people 
of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, and he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So this prophecy uh, takes us from the decree um, for the Israelites to restore and rebuild the city of Jerusalem to the coming of the Messiah. And really it takes us beyond that, right? Because it describes a time that is yet future when there will be no more sin or transgression, when there will be this period of everlasting righteousness. And um, we talked about that last week. Here, Gabriel divides the, the 77s that we looked at last week into three Section. So uh, there is the first seven weeks or the first seven sevens. It's a more literal way to translate it. Uh, there is the following 62 sevens, and then there is a final seven. Uh, Gabriel says in verse 25, he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then, for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. So, uh, this verse describes the beginning of the 70 weeks. It starts with a decree to restore and uh, rebuild Jerusalem. And uh, again, this is something else we talked about last week, but there were these various decrees that were issued and interpreters uh, attempt to uh, align, some interpreters attempt to align certain decrees with this prophecy. Uh, there was the decree of Cyrus in 538 BC, which allowed the Jewish people to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. There was the decree of Darius in Ezra 6, that came when the people um, were rebuilding, but they began to experience opposition. Uh, there was a decree that uh, uh, sort of uh, reaffirmed, or, or that decree by Darius sort of reaffirmed the decree of Cyrus. The, but then there was also a decree of Artaxerxes in five, uh, excuse me, 457 BC uh, that gave Ezra the authority to uh, enforce the, the, the law of Moses and to restore worship. And then there was a second decree by Artaxerxes in 445 BC, which authorized Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, again, Daniel says that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one comes, there shall be seven weeks or there shall be seven sevens. And so again, personally, I think these numbers are best taken as symbolic. Uh, the text refers to 77s without explicitly referring to units. Of course, the, the ESE, ESV translates it as seven weeks, um, but whether the, the sevens are days so that it's a week, whether it's weeks, years, months, it doesn't actually indicate in the text. And so that leaves the interpretation uh, open. Even if we understand it as weeks, which I don't think is completely unreasonable, um, those who understand it as weeks don't actually understand it as literal weeks, right? They understand it as weeks of years, meaning they're seven year periods of time, um, which isn't literal. So, so why, why, why does it have to refer to a literal period of 490 years if it doesn't refer to a period of a literal 70 weeks. And so I think it's under uh, it's understanding it's understandable to take it as symbolic weeks because uh, again the symbolic use of numbers in apocalyptic literature is common and it it seems that every attempt to try to align the 70 weeks with specific historical events sort of requires some interpretive gymnastics, such as arbitrarily selecting the decree that comes closest to starting the timeline at the place that's most likely to end where you want it to end, whether it's Christ's coming or his crucifixion or whatever that might be. And uh, last week I mentioned the fact that Jesus himself uses this very same number symbolically when he uh, talks to Peter. Peter asks him how many times he should forgive his brother. 
And Peter says, up to seven times, and Jesus says, no, I tell you, but uh, 70 times seven. And so I think the 77s symbolizes the fullness of God's redemptive plan, uh, rather than providing us with a specific way to figure out the, the decree. So my battery just died, but that's okay. You can still hear me. And, and so it's not so much about figuring out which decree. The point is that there will be a decree, right? And God's uh, sovereignty will uh, work to bring about the decree for the people to return to the city of Jerusalem. And in that sense, all of the decrees, all four of the decrees are a fulfillment of what the Lord said would take place in the, the restoration of the people of Israel to the promised land. So the, the 70 weeks or the time of God's plan of redemption, it begins with the decree to restore and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And uh, notice again, the end of verse 25, it says, For 62 weeks, Jerusalem shall be built again with squares and moat, uh, which is to say that it will re be rebuilt in a way that is extensive, uh, people debate what the squares and the moat are. Uh, the moat may be a literal moat, some sort of fortification, that, uh, and it may have been to a limited area of the city that was put in place when the walls were not yet there. Uh, the squares may have referred to uh, actual city squares or open places within the city. Uh, again, the point is that it will be re rebuilt in a way that is extensive. But at the end of verse 25, it says, in a troubled time. And when uh, Jerusalem was rebuilt, it was a time of challenge and uh, difficulty. In Ezra and Nehemiah, we read about how the Jewish people faced opposition from various enemies. Uh, there were those who opposed them, those who attempted to put a stop from the work. And uh, yet, obviously, God's purposes can't be thwarted. And uh, Jerusalem was ultimately rebuilt just as God had sovereignly declared that it would be. And, and really, I think there's a lesson here for us today, that there's an application that can be made, because there are times when we might be discouraged that God isn't accomplishing uh, what we think that he should accomplish in our lives. And, and, and maybe it's because we encounter some kind of difficulty, right? Maybe we encounter some sort of opposition, and yet we shouldn't expect that the path of obedience is necessarily going to be easy. Uh, we continue to live in a fallen world with fallen people, and whether we're rebuilding a city like Ezra and Nehemiah, whether we're raising a family or sharing Christ with our neighbors or working to see our church uh, grow and become healthy, uh, whatever it is, God's purposes almost always go forth in the midst of difficulty and challenge. And yet the point we see here is that it is not possible for God's plans to fail. He is faithful to his promises. He's accomplishing his purposes and Christ is building his church. And uh, all of this is true even when the circumstances are difficult. And so the, the opposition that the people of Israel faced when they undertook the work of rebuilding the city uh, didn't prevent the Lord from fulfilling the promises that he made. And uh, likewise, the difficulty that we face in our own lives doesn't prevent the Lord from fulfilling his promises to us. The uh, angel, angel Gabriel continues by describing the 62 sevens. So if those are weeks of years, that would be 434 years. And this period culminates when the anointed one, the prince, is cut off. Now, uh, this has been interpreted in various ways. Notice again, verse 27, that there are seven weeks from the decree to the coming of the anointed one. And uh, the most natural way to understand that is as a reference to the Messiah, uh, but then there will be 62 weeks, and at the end of the 62 weeks, the anointed one uh, shall be cut off. So if these are weeks of years, and if we were to interpret that literally, then that would mean that there would be 49 years after the decree when the, the, the Messiah came, and then another 434 years uh, until the time when the Messiah was cut off. Obviously, that timeline doesn't work. But again, if the number is symbolic, we avoid that difficulty. And often the number seven uh, 
uh, represents that which is perfect or complete. And so when Jesus says that you should forgive your brother 70 times seven, it's not like he's putting a limit on the number of times that you're required to forgive your brother as though, you know, if your brother sins against you 491 times, then you don't have to forgive him anymore, right? He's saying that your perfect, or your forgiveness should be perfect, that it should be complete. And whenever there's an opportunity to forgive, uh, that's what we should do. Not that we'll be able to, to do that, but that's the goal. That's what we should strive for. And the same thing is true here. Seventy sevens is the time during which God will bring redemption and he will execute his perfect plan in perfect time and he will um, execute that plan to its completion. Now, uh, the anointed one that is described here is uh, pretty clearly a reference to Christ. And after Jerusalem is rebuilt, as history continues to unfold, it moves towards the fulfillment of God's promises in the coming of Christ. And and this is really, it's, it's really quite awesome, right? Because for centuries, God has orchestrated the rise and fall of nations. Uh, God has been at work. He has restored his people to the land so that Jerusalem is rebuilt. Uh, There have been countless other events, and all of this culminates in the coming of his son. Uh, The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. And so uh, history isn't just random. Our God is the God of history, and his purposes in history center on Jesus Christ. So uh, again, I don't think the 77s presents us with some sort of rigid chronological framework so much as it presents us with a more general, uh, albeit indefinite period of time wherein the fullness of God's perfect plan will unfold. But uh, however you understand it, even if you take the the 77s as a literal 490 years, the overarching message is really the same. Uh, God is sovereign over history, and God is sovereignly bringing about his purposes according to his own perfect timing. Uh, The coming of Christ wasn't plan B, right? It's not like God intended for the people of Israel uh, to, to, to just obey and to usher in the, uh, the kingdom of God through their obedience. Uh, Christ was uh, planned before the foundation of the world. And uh, ultimately, Christ came to do the things that we read about in verse 24, right? He came to finish transgression, to atone for inequity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. He came to deal with the problem of sin once and for all. And Uh, Jesus, through his sinless life, fulfilled every aspect of the Old Testament law and thereby secured the Father's blessing through his obedience. Uh, He then went to the cross uh, rather than entering into that blessing, and he bore the punishment that we deserved. Uh, We see that in verse 26. It says, the anointed one uh, shall be cut off and have nothing. And when Jesus died on the cross, some 500 years after this was written, it was the fulfillment of that prophecy. So when you look out at the world and things look chaotic, it seems like uh, maybe God isn't in control. uh, And and maybe you don't know what's happening with China and Russia, or you don't know what's going on in the Middle East, or um, there are tensions between one group of Americans and another group of Americans, you can know that history is not just spiraling out of control. It is unfolding according to God's perfect plan. And at the center of that plan is Jesus Christ. You know, it's sort of like in any story that you read, right? If you read a novel, if you watch a movie, in any story, there's there's this part in the story where things seem like they're going out of control. Right, And there's this conflict and it reaches a climax and you think the hero's going to lose and everything's going to be lost, but that's not what happened. Right, The, the hero comes and saves the day. So um, the God who decreed the 77s is the same God who sent Christ to redeem us. And he is the same God who is at work even now to bring his kingdom to fulfillment.
So whenever life feels chaotic, remember that God's purposes are good and that God's purposes cannot fail. Jesus has come and Jesus will come again. Now, <clears throat> continuing in verse 26, Gabriel says, After the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. So, again, uh, this verse begins in a way that was probably unexpected to the original readers. Uh, the anointed one will be cut off. The anointed one will be killed. And yet that word cut off also has connotations of rejection, separation, abandonment. And so the Messiah will come and yet he will be rejected and killed. And the text says he will have nothing. He will have no worldly power, no possessions, no uh, earthly kingdom. And, and so you can imagine the original audience reading this and wondering how that could possibly be. How is it that the one who is anointed to come and redeem his people and usher in the kingdom and lead them to this final victory can be cut off? And yet we see in the New Testament that when Jesus was cut off, it wasn't a failure by God to fulfill his plan. It was the very means by which God accomplished that plan. And uh, we see the same thing in Isaiah. Isaiah uh, said the same thing new, nearly two centuries earlier. In Isaiah 53, Isaiah says uh, concerning the Messiah, By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. And the, the anointed one, the Lord Jesus, was cut off. He bore the wrath of God that we deserved, so that we could be reconciled to him in faith. And so when Jesus was cut off, it was in order to put an end to transgression, to atone for sin, and to uh, bring in everlasting righteousness. And, you know, that message, that's really the heart of the gospel message, right? Jesus was cut off so that we could be reconciled and brought near to God. Jesus was cursed so that we could be blessed. Jesus died so that we could live. And if you've never placed your faith in Christ before, this is the message that you need to hear, right? There's nothing that you can do to save yourself. Um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's nothing that we can do to earn God's favor uh, by the way that we live our lives. We all deserve God's judgment because of our disobedience. And yet the good news is that Jesus has already done everything that is necessary to secure the salvation of his people. He took our sin upon himself. He bore the judgment that should have fallen upon us. And if you've never placed your faith in Christ the, the only way that you can be saved is through what Christ has done. Uh, and, and you need to recognize that there's nothing that you can do to save yourself. And so the, the message is to repent, right? To stop relying upon what you can do and to turn and put your trust and confidence in what uh, Jesus has done. Gabriel continues in verse 26 with a prophecy about the destruction of the city. It says, uh, excuse me, verse 27, and he shall make a strong covenant with the many for one week, excuse me, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wings of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the, the desolator. So this, this passage is a bit difficult. It's been interpreted in different ways. Um, we know, what, what we know is that when the anointed one comes and is cut off, there will be a prince who will come and his people will destroy the city and the temple in Jerusalem. Now, uh, we know from history that Roman armies besieged Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, that came shortly after Jesus was cut off. In fact, uh, Jesus himself told his disciples that this is what was going to happen in Matthew 24. 
Uh, when Jesus and his di disciples are in Jerusalem, the disciples look at the temple complex and they ask Jesus, you know, what he thinks about all of these magnificent stones and um, everything with the temple complex. And Jesus says, uh, truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And uh, that's exactly what happened. In fact, um, there hasn't been a temple in Jerusalem since 70 AD when the Romans destroyed it. Uh, and, and yet even in that, I think we see God's faithfulness, right? Because the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple was not the end of God's redemptive plan. Uh, rather, it was a shift in God's redemptive plan. Uh, it was a shift towards the culmination of his plan, really, because the temple sacrifices were no longer needed because Jesus himself provided the once and for all sacrifice when he died on the cross. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit came, a down, came down upon Jesus, uh, descended upon him, and dwelt in him so that he became the temple. And in, through faith in Christ, we become God's temple. And so the, the temple sacrifices are no longer needed because Jesus is the fulfillment of everything um, towards which the Old Testament sacrifices pointed. And so as we come to verse 27, the angel Gabriel turns his attention to the final period of uh, the seven weeks where it uh, talks about this individual who will make a strong covenant and put an end to sacrifice and then uh, one shall come who makes desolate. And so uh, who exactly will make a strong covenant with the many for one week? Some interpreters understand the he. He will make a strong covenant with many for one week. Uh, some interpreters understand the he to be a reference to Christ. And the strong covenant then is a reference to the new covenant that Christ establishes through his redemptive work. And, and so Christ comes, he carries out his ministry, but in the middle of the, the week, he is cut off. And when he is crucified, that puts an end to the sacrific sacrificial system because Jesus provides the once and for all sacrifice. Other interpreters view this covenant as something entirely different, uh, a future covenant, a uh, covenant that is yet future from our vantage point, uh, made by an antichrist figure. And so under that view, the, the strong covenant is uh, some sort of agreement that will ultimately be broken and will lead to the, the desolation that is described here. And uh, those who understand the passage in this way see this final week as taking place during uh, an as yet future seven year period of uh, tribulation during which time uh, God's people will be persecuted. And then there are still other interpreters who see this final week as a period that represents the ongoing struggle between God's kingdom and the forces of evil throughout history. So uh, under this view, the covenant, uh, the, the, the cessation of sacrifice, the desolation, all of that recur, or, uh, refers to a recurring pattern of conflict and redemption in the lives of God's people. So for me, I sort of gravitate to, towards a, a mix of the, for primarily the first view, but maybe with a, a little a smidgen of the last view thrown in. I think this is a uh, particular fulfillment that came with the coming of Christ and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, but it also seems to represent a recurring pattern that we see in various historic figures that rise up and oppress the people of God. However we understand it, I think the central truth and the main point is really the same. God is sovereign over history and God's purposes for his people will prevail, right? That's the message that was intended by the angel Gabriel for the people who read, originally read this, people who were living during a time of difficulty and exile, and uh, this is encouragement to them, and, and it should encourage us in the same way. The, um, the, the angel Gabriel goes on to describe the, the wing of abominations and the one who makes desolate. 
This is probably one of the most challenging parts of the text. It um, obviously refers to an act of desecration. It uses the same language that's used elsewhere to refer to what the, um, the, the, the leader Antiochus IV did when he sacrificed a pig on the altar. I've mentioned that a couple of times in this series. So uh, that was in 167 BC. So the, the wing of abominations could point to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Um, it could also point to future acts of opposition against God that will culminate in the final judgment. It's honestly not particularly clear to me. So you, you can go home and study it and uh, come back and explain it to me, help me to understand it. Uh, what is certain is that the desolation is not the final word. Right? Gabriel assures Daniel that the decreed end is poured out on the one who makes desolate, on the desolator, which is to say that God's judgment will ultimately fall upon the one who opposes him. And the forces of evil, no matter how powerful they might seem, uh, they are destined for destruction. So, you know, Opposition to God's kingdom is real, but those who oppose God will not ultimately prevail. And whether this passage, whether it points to historical events, whether it points to a future tribulation, whether it points to symbolic patterns that are true throughout history, the message is that evil won't triumph. The forces of darkness are operating on borrowed time, and they will ultimately meet their end. So, uh, our job is to live in light of this victory that God has promised because history is moving towards a very definite conclusion. And as we await the return of Christ, as we await the coming of God's kingdom in all of its fullness, we are to remember these truths. We're to remember these promises and we're to live our lives in light of those things. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for... The, the way that you reveal your promises to us and for the way that those promises can sustain us. We pray that you would increase our faith, that you would give us the eyes of faith so that we, as we uh, see these promises, that our confidence would rest very firmly on uh, what you have revealed in your word, that our confidence would be in you. And when uh, circumstances seem overwhelming, when circumstances um, are, are, are difficult and we undergo tribulation, uh, we pray that our faith would not be shaken, that you would sustain us and help us to remember that you are in control working your purposes uh, we do pray that you would help us to be faithful, that you would help us to be obedient, and um, uh, particularly in those times of difficulty. We pray that you would uh, continue your work in our lives, even in these, um, these next few moments as we turn our attention to the Lord's Supper. We pray that you would help us to remember the gospel that is proclaimed in the Lord's Supper and that that gospel would nourish us and sustain us. We thank you for the truth of what is revealed in the Lord's Supper uh, concerning our union with Christ in his death. Uh, help us, Lord, as we um, desire to be obedient and to fulfill the commission that you have called us to fulfill. And we pray these things all in Christ's name. Amen.